Uh, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Awesome. Thank you so much for, for coming out tonight. Uh, my name is Golan Levin. I'm a professor of art and director of the facility you're in, which is the Frank Ratchy Studio for Creative Inquiry. This is the research laboratory of Carnegie Mellon's College of Fine Arts, dedicated to atypical, anti-disciplinary, and inter-institutional research and outreach at the intersection of art, science, technology, and culture. Um, tonight we have uh, another uh, instance in our Steiner Lecture Series in Creative Inquiry. Um, our guest is Memo Acton. Uh, Memo uh, studied civil engineering in Istanbul and left uh, Turkey to London in 1997 to escape the military. Um, he uh, has been active as a media artist in London ever since. <clears throat> uh, he's also an avid bird watcher, as I understand it. Um, he is uh, in 2013 with Davide Queola. Uh, the winner of the Pre Ars Electronica, the Golden Nika, the highest award in uh, media arts in the world, uh, in the computer animation uh, field for his project called Forms. And uh, he has been doing a diverse range of work, ranging, spanning uh, interactive installation, uh, machine learning, virtual reality. Uh, presently, he's a doctoral student at Goldsmiths um, in London, studying computing and the arts. And uh, it's my pleasure to introduce Memo Acton. Right, hi everyone, thanks for coming. I thought that would set the tone quite nicely for the rest of my talk. Um, so it's great to be here. I, this is my second attempt. I had visa issues uh, prior. So today I'm going to talk about intelligent machines that learn. What do they know? Do they know things? Let's find out. I'm also going to talk a little bit about my, my PhD research under the catchy title of uh, real-time interactive multimodal media synthesis and continuous control using generative deep neural networks for creative expression and human-machine artistic co-creation. So I've got about a year left to figure out the title um, and I'm gonna yeah, basically be talking about these. I'm mostly going to talk about my recent work today, like from the last couple of years, which is my art practice and it's mostly going to be research in relation to AI, which is conceptually motivated by a few different themes, where each theme is actually an hour talk in itself. And I wasn't sure what to talk about, so I'm going to try to touch upon each of them um, just, just a little bit. And these are primarily investigating what does it mean to learn, what does it mean to understand, and using machine learning algorithms as a way to reflect on how we make sense of the world. Also exploring connections between the rise of AI and deep learning as a consequence of big data, as an analog to the biological evolution of intelligence, possibly kick-started by the evolution of vision 500 million years ago and the Cambrian explosion that followed. But also drawing inspiration from the cultural evolution of the ultimate panopticon, that is the all-seeing eye of God and organized religion. And as we submit to technology, seeing that replaced by the surveillance economies of the internet, 
and the war on terror as the primary fuel for the funding and development of what we call AI today. Before all of that, I want to give a bit of broader context and talk, just spend a couple of minutes talking about what I was doing before all of that. So this is going back now um, about 15 years or so. And so the core theme throughout all of my work is using computation as a language through which to express thoughts and feelings. And particularly the ideas that I'm thinking about is technology, both as not just the medium, but also the subject matter. So thinking of technology as extensions of the human body, as extensions of the mind, but also its impact on us as individuals and on how we behave and express ourselves, the impact on society, on culture, on ethics, on law, on tradition and religion. And a lot of this early work that you're seeing right now, the primary motivation was actually exploring to, to actually quote Golan, new modes of expression. So creating real-time systems that enable a human user to tap into the system and be able to augment their own abilities to creatively express themselves. For this, a real-time feedback loop is essential. Um, in fact, when I was talking about this 10, 15 years ago, I didn't really know about the neuroscience underneath this. But now as I've learned more about things like active perception, act active inference, I've now come to realize that this being able to control our eyes is an integral part of being able to see. So now I see those parallels between the interactive computational systems that I and the people in this lab have been creating. Um, is an integral part of interacting with these systems. So over the years, you can think of these systems as a system that maps some kind of input to some kind of output. And that mapping function is something which I traditionally, as the designer of the system or developer, have been designing as a rule-based system. And it is possible to get very unpredictable behavior out of these approaches but I've become more and more interested in how to make that mapping more unpredictable and find different ways of designing it. And that's how I got into machine learning. Um, and that's going to be the most of what I talk about today. So I had this realization a few years ago that all of my work was either about waves or God and somehow usually about both. And when I look back, I think that what I mean by waves is the notions of patterns in nature, which we humans have somehow managed to recognize, decipher and formalize into equations. And I think what I mean by God represents those mysterious aspects of nature, which we have yet to understand, and the lengths that we go to to try and make sense of it all. And what I mean by quantum mechanics is the fringes of human knowledge which somehow we empirically know to be true and we're able to mathematically formulate but on a more deeper human level we are really unable to understand what it really means. So more broadly speaking I'm interested in the tensions between science, technology, nature, ethics, law, ritual and religion. <clears throat> so this is one kind of waves, oceanic waves. I grew by the sea and I am obsessed by the sea. I could spend and have done all day sitting and just watching the ocean without getting bored. But I want to talk about a different kind of waves as well. <clears throat> so this, some of you are already, I spoke to about this project last week. I'm not going to go as much detail today. I just want to talk about it from a different perspective. So there's many incarnations of this project, but I just want to get to, actually, I'll just show the simplest form of it, which is this. So this is from 2011. <clears throat> it's an incredibly simple rule-based system. And when you look at it, you might see a lot of moving parts. And it might even look a bit complicated as you watch it for longer. But there's one, there's only one really, really simple rule here. And that is the number of agents, they're oscillating at different but fixed frequencies 
like different rhythms and the interaction of these different rhythms create very complex behaviour. And that's kind of the, um, the inspiration behind it, complexity from simplicity. And when you look at this, maybe, I'm guessing, you might start to break down this complexity back into simplicity. You will start seeing some simple rules which govern this behaviour. But the interesting thing is, it's quite possible that the simple rules that you deduct from this are not the simple rules that I coded into it. It's an emergent, higher level of simplicity which came out of the emergent complexity. So in a way the question is, is that simplicity there or are you projecting it onto it? And obviously there's something there for you to recognise, but this is at the heart of what I've been working with a lot, which is humans as pattern recognition machines. This was another incarnation of the same project. On, It's exactly the same thing, but literally projected on the cloud. I shall skip this for now. This is another piece. This is another quite old piece. This is from 2009. This is the other end of the spectrum. This is footage of a dancer that's fed into, you know, a camera feed is fed into a piece of software that's performing computer vision analysis and feeding that into a fluid simulation. Probably the only time that my civil engineering degree actually came useful is fluid simulations. Um, so this is a lot more complicated. In fact, this is pretty complicated. Like the amount of maths and calculus that goes into this is um, far beyond most of my other work. But when we humans look at this, we just see, yeah, human, easy, there's a person there dancing. It's like all of this complex movement is filtered through, and by the time it reaches high levels of cognition, we are not seeing maths or calculus. We are just seeing a dancing person with a bunch of smoke. And I'm fascinated by how efficient we are at recognizing this. Furthermore, if you were to look at this image, you might not see a person you just see an abstract blob. Maybe you can see a person because you know there's one. I can tell you that there's a person here, so now maybe you can see the person, but you might not know where is the head, where are the arms, you know, you might have a hypothesis, but you're not sure. But it's through movement that you're able to learn, or rather project, your prior beliefs, your prior knowledge about our limb constraints and the way that we move and the laws of physics, you're able to see where the legs are, where the arms are. And even when you lose, when it becomes really, really abstract, you're able to simulate, you're, ab you're able to play forward where the head might be, where the arm might be, so that when it does come back into recognizable forms, you're able to latch back onto it. So I find this stuff really fascinating. And when I'm talking about waves, I'm talking about this. I'm talking about the patterns that repeat, but they're not necessarily repeating exactly the same every time. Another older piece from 2014. Um, this is Equilibrium. This was initially inspired by ecosystems hanging in a very fragile balance that when we touch, that balance breaks and the system falls into chaos. It's a touchscreen installation and there are literally millions of objects here, like 10 million pixels, so each pixel is a dynamically simulated object. And this might look like a still image, uh, but actually every pixel here is oscillating all over the screen, like there's a lot of movement here, but they're just moving so quickly, it's in equilibrium. And then when you touch this, the overall equilibrium falls apart and it basically falls out of homeostasis and it tries to find a new configuration where it can find homeostasis. So, like I said, this was initially inspired by ecosystems and you know, even when something as devastating as a meteor strikes the planet and wipes out 75% of all living species, including the dominant species, the dinosaurs, and sends the Earth into chaos for centuries, somehow it finds a new equilibrium. Now we are here and we're upsetting that balance and inevitably we will be wiped out at some point as well. But 
life in the universe will go on. So this was the initial motivation, but actually it turns out that the brain is also a complex dynamical system with about 100 billion neurons and each with thousands of synapses that fire to trigger neighboring neurons to fire and this creates these feedback loops. Yet somehow the brain doesn't go out of control. Of course, sometimes it does, unfortunately, when you know, people have seizures. But most of the time, the system is trying to find a balance. And while many neuroscientists study individual neurons, even more neuroscientists study populations of neurons, looking at how activations ripple through the, the brain or the neocortex. And many researchers believe that actually the, the goal of the, the brain is to stay at homeostasis. It's to find this equilibrium. And every time we get new inputs, whether it's from our senses or from within our body, this equilibrium is perturbed and the brain is trying to stabilize this. And that act of trying to stabilize is actually the act of what we call perception or cognition. And that brings me on to the main act of the evening, which is AI. Um, I try to avoid that term as much as possible because it's so ambiguous and it unpacks differently in people, different people's minds. For example, the internet seems to think it's blue and shiny. Um, which is not how I see it. This is what I think of. Um, particularly, I work with machine learning. Um, so I don't talk about AI, I talk about machine learning. That's what I work with. And this is what machine learning actually looks like. But before that, just a very quick history lesson um, to explain why I'm so interested in machine learning. So some of you might recognize Charles Babbage, one of the uh, grandfathers of general purpose computing, designed a bunch of um, mechanical computers in the 1800s, and we know about these machines mainly through Lady Ada Lovelace's notes. Coincidentally, tomorrow is Ada Lovelace Day, um, celebrating the achievements of women in uh, science, engineering, maths, and um, usually under acknowledged as well. So she was 17 when she started working with Babbage and was his not only collaborator but intellectual peer while well, she was collaborating with him. And it's through her notes that we know about this machine, but also centuries of foresight. She says the analytical engine weaves algebraic patterns just as the jacquard loom weaves flowers and leaves. And one of her most profound insights was while Babbage was interested in being able to calculate anything, she saw the potential to go beyond numbers, operate on symbols and do general purpose computing such that the engine might compose elaborate and scientific pieces of music of any degree or complexity or extent, she said in 1843, in a way foreshadowing, you know, centuries before the, the computational generative art movement. However, she also said the controversial statement, the analytical engine has no pretensions whatever to originate anything. It can do whatever we know how to order it to perform. It can follow analysis but it has no power of anticipating any analytical revelations or truths. Its province is to assist us in making available what we are already acquainted with. And two centuries later, we're still arguing whether she was right or wrong. And given the state of technology and knowledge in the 1800s, uh, and given the computers were mechanical at this stage, I completely agree with her. About a century later, however, as digital technology was being born and the theory of computation, Alan Turing had issues with this statement as well. And in a seminal paper, he opened with, can machines think in 1950? And again, a century later, almost, we're still arguing. So he addresses this as Lady Alvarez's objection. And he says, in order to be considered to originate anything, a machine should be able to surprise people, even its programmer. And he adds, machines take me by surprise with great frequency. And he had theorized two years prior the concept of machines that can learn, because he'd designed this system called the unorganized machine inspired by neurons. And he goes on to say, instead of trying to produce a program to simulate the adult mind, why not rather try to produce one which simulates the child's? If this were then subjected to an appropriate course of action, one would obtain the adult's brain. And goes on to say, an important feature of a learning machine is that its teacher will often be very largely ignorant of what is going on inside. And this is 
simultaneously the most interesting and exciting, but also most dangerous aspect of machine learning. It's because of this aspect that we will truly go beyond our own capabilities, and whether that will go to good places or not so desirable places is a big open question and a very important one. So this is what machine learning looks like. The idea is, instead of programming the function f that maps an input to an output, you learn the function f. You might have heard deep learning. It's um, the new craze right now. So this is what I'm working with as well. This is what deep learning looks like. It's the same thing, except this function f is replaced by loads of functions. And one of the reasons why I love it is because the 10-year-old me gets really excited because this is when you pipe data through a deep neural network, it is literally a journey through multiple dimensions and transformations in space and time. Um, because each block here is a nonlinear, high-dimensional transformation extracting unique features from the previous blocks to build a hierarchy of increasingly abstract representations. So what does that even mean? It means that in the depths of these representations is the great unknown. So most of you are already probably familiar with Deep Dream and you're already fed up of it three years ago. Um, we do live in a post Deep Dream era. Um, this was the greatest viral marketing campaign that Google has ever launched, probably, and they recognize that. NVIDIA now recognize it, so now um, machine learning as research is a viral marketing tool. The reason I love Deep Dream, though, is not the aesthetics. It's not even what the algorithm is doing. What I really love about this work is, so this is your research by Google. Um, what I really love is, so this is an image classification network that's being run backwards trying to recognize patterns in an image that it doesn't know, i.e. me. People say, oh, look, at it. it's just full of puppy slugs, it's full of lizard dogs or that kind of stuff. But there are no such things as puppy slugs or bird lizards in these images. When we're looking at these images, what's happening is we are trying to make sense of this, which is basically a particular distribution of noise, we are projecting what we think we see onto these images, and that is exactly what Deep Dream is doing. So when we're looking at these images, we're locked in a feedback loop of confirmation bias with the network. And this is what I like about working with these algorithms, using them as a way to reflect on our own biases and how we make sense of the world. Because the network is trained to take this, or generative networks in general, not necessarily Deep Dream, are trained to take this white noise, put it through a journey through multiple dimensions and transformation space and time, and produce this. And then we look at this, and what do we do? We write stories, because that's what we do. What, that's what we've always done, that's what we always will do. We find regularities, and we make up stories, and then we believe them. And everything that we see, read, or hear, even these words that I'm saying right now, you're making sense of, relating to your own past experiences. It's impossible for me to know what you're thinking as a result of hearing these words, even though we have a shared, agreed vocabulary. And when we don't even have a shared vocabulary, then it gets even more complicated. But I'll get back to some work. These are some early experiments from a few years ago. Um, they're samples from a network I trained on tens of thousands of images, I, artworks I scraped from the Google Arts project. Um, so one of the narratives, which I won't go into too deep, is regarding the emergence of AI um, driven by the needs of surveillance to replace our previous overseer, which was religion. And now Google is not only our overseer, but is moving into the role of the purveyor of art and culture as well, as the church was before it. So there's this huge Google Arts archive, which I've scraped. Um, and so these are some of the, the outputs. And these, I don't do any categories. These aren't just landscapes or sketches. This is everything. They're illustrations, sketches, photographs, scientific illustrations, portraits, maritime scenes, abstract images. Um, that at the time I did this, state of the art was 64 pixels by 64 pixels. So this was super low res. And I used another method to upscale them to um, 16,000 by 16,000. So they have a, a very kind of fractal-like quality. So because 
all the categories are dumped into one melting pot. They're generally very abstract. Um, sometimes you can think, okay, that was probably some kind of a sketch or drawing or illustration. That's probably some kind of a, a landscape. That's probably some kind of a portrait. That's kind of like a portrait landscape mix. I don't know what that is, but it looks like some kind of humanoid form. Um, I did an installation, a few installations around this. Uh, on one side, it's training live on a bunch of surveillance cameras, um, and then it's hallucinating based on what it's seeing now and based on what it had seen before. I also worked, so in machine learning, you have to clean your data, it's called. Um, you have to like align the faces, make sure everything's perfectly, you know, I, I don't like doing that. I, I was curious what happens if you work on dirty data. So this is dirty data. I scraped Google image search for right-wing politicians. Um, you, might, you might recognize this one. Um, but I'll, I'll, I'll move on actually. So again, these were early experiments. This is also quite early. My main aim is how do I control generative deep neural networks? Whereas the previous examples I showed, you just train, you say generate, it generates. The question is how can I manipulate the output? And also linking it back to perception and bias. So some of you might have heard of like style transfer where you take the a, like an image of a painting by Monet and you apply that style to a photograph. This is not that. Uh, this is a network that I trained on about tens of thousands of images scraped from the Hubble Space Telescope. So this network has seen nothing but images of space. And now it's seeing me with this USB microscope and it's trying to make sense of what it's seeing through the lens of what it's seen before. And because this network has seen tens of thousands of images of, of the cosmos, the, well, an idealistic point of view would be that it's learned something about the structure of space. It's learned about nebulas, it's learned about stars, it's learned about galaxies. So that when I'm trying to construct an image that's bright, it doesn't just create a bright image, it uses structural components which are bright. So it will use uh, you know, glowing streams of gas, etc. And this allows me to control the output, so I can tell it to generate a darker image and it will use distant stars and galaxies instead of using nebulas, etc. And there's a few motivations behind why I use this particular data set. Um, one, of course, it's space. Space is cool. Uh, it's, it's where God lives, as, as I like to think, if she exists. The other one is, of course, we're all made of stardust. Uh, the atoms in my body and your body were forged in the hearts of supernova before they come together to momentarily become you and me. Three, if the universe is indeed infinite, then every single nebula you're seeing right now exists somewhere out there at some point in time. And that's quite, yeah, something to grasp with. Number four that I find quite fascinating is when I say that this network is trained on images from the Space Hubble Telescope, these aren't actually images of space because the Space Hubble Telescope doesn't give us images. It just gives us a stream of numbers. And then human artists stitch those together. They color grade them, they composite them, and they produce romanticized visions of what we think space looks like. So actually this network isn't learning what space looks like. This network is learning what humans think space should look like. And finally, this network is looking at the world right now. It's looking at me and it's trying to make sense of what it's seeing based on what it's seen before. But it can only see what it already knows, just like us. So this is another very, it's very similar project, just different data sets. I'll let this play for a while and let you enjoy the Amanda Galas' gorgeous voice. Sadly, once a day, I waited and waited with flowers in my eyes. 
Actually, one thing I should say, I was quite shocked to see that it's learnt about foam. The network knows where to put foam. Um, and even, I mean, you can't always see it, but you create such waves that it will create really long foam. So it knows that certain shapes, like in what direction the foam should flow, etc. And that quite surprised me pleasantly. So this is a neural network that hasn't been trained on anything and it's opening its eyes for the first time. So whereas before all of those networks, you know, you put it through a really, really long training process. This is literally randomly uninitialized, randomly initialized training live on webcam. And it's what it's trying to do is it's trying to identify common features in everything that it's seeing so that it can most optimally store and represent the current signal that's coming so that it can most optimally represent future frames. And so with the minimum amount of information, express the maximum amount of expressivity based on its knowledge of the world. So I've made a few installation versions of this and particularly, so here there's three screens, three squares rather, the image on the left is, is a live reconstruction, let's say. So I call that, um, this is a very early version that you're seeing here. So nowadays I, I, I label that perceiving. So that's like a live reconstruction of the live input. The middle frame, what's happening is I'm putting in a bit of noise into the network, not onto the feed, but into the depths of the network. And what this does is it causes the network to reconstruct images that are somehow reminiscent of what it's seeing right now. So I call that frame reminiscing. So I should say nowhere in the system are images stored. There are th all there is is the network. And so by injecting a bit of noise, it's able to recall or rather reconstruct images which are kind of like memories that look like what it is now. So if I were to stand in front of the camera for like five minutes, it memorizes me and then I step away, but someone else comes and assumes the same pose, it will recall me in that pose. But again, there's no image of me, it's just generating that image. And what's so fascinating here is, this is not a behavior. So first of all, like memory itself isn't a recollection of a hard, stored data, Re the act of recalling a memory is filtering it through your present self already. And these behaviors are not behaviors that I programmed in, they're emergent properties of the neural network. The panel on the very right, is give, which I call dreaming, is giving just white noise. So this is disconnected from the camera, it's just white noise and the ne network is trying to make sense of that. So it's just recalling everything that it's ever seen. Or rather, it's not recalling images, it's reconstructing images that are made out of fragments of everything that it's ever seen. So this is a, a project I call Hello World. I've also worked a bit with text. This is a poem I wrote in 2014, a collaboration with Google. Uh, not people working at Google, but actual Google, uh, the search engine, the one that lives in the cloud. Um, because we have a very intimate connection with the cloud. We confide to it, we confess to it, we appeal to it, we share secrets with it. We tell it things that we wouldn't tell our closest friends or family. And Google is the keeper of our collective consciousness. It sees everything we see, knows everything we know, it feels everything we feel. So this poem is actually more a collection of prayers. And so these are the prayers of 2014. Um, as you saw, I write the first few words and then the keeper of our collective consciousness completes it. 
another project I did with words is um, regarding these models called word uh, or globe. They're basically word embedding models. The idea is you give this algorithm a huge corpus of text. So there's a quite a famous model. Um, a hun there's a hundred billion words from news, from Google News. And what it does is it learns to arrange words in a semantic space of, say, about 300 dimensions, such that there are relationships between the positions of words in that space that preserve a kind of meaning. Um, very famous, so then you can do geometric operations on these words. For example, you can do queen minus king plus man, and it will, th the algorithm will say, okay, the result is woman, so it's learned about gender in relation to king or queen. It can learn about tense, swam minus swimming plus walking, it gives you walked. It can learn country capital um, relationships, Madrid minus Spain plus Italy, it gives you Rome. So I was, these two relationships not enforced by humans. The algorithm just picks these up going through the data. So I was curious, you know, what else is in these models? So I wrote a Twitter bot that picks random words, does random mathematical operations on them, and then tweets them. So this is a very, very highly curated, cherry-picked set of results. I was blown away that Twitter plus bots is, is a meme. Like, this is what the network has learned. Um, but what's really fascinating, again, going back to the deep dream aspect, is it, I, I found it very difficult to separate what the model is learning versus what I'm projecting back onto what I think the model has learned. For example, human, human minus God is animal. Now, to me, this is really profound. Or maybe it's just a floating point in precision, and I'm just projecting this meaning back onto it. Um, nature, without God, is just dynamics. Like, that's beautiful. Um, or maybe that's, that's just me. Like, authorities minus philosopher equals police or governments. Like, does that mean something? Does that mean that an authoritarian government, that f if philosophy is critical thinking, that doesn't try to, like, you know, maybe I'm reading too much into this. Um, but, so this was a fun Twitter project. Uh, another one I did around about the same time, there's this quite famous results um, that came out looking at gender bias in these models, such that doctor minus man plus woman, the result is the model gives is nurse. Um, now actually this isn't correct, uh, so there's, this is the other twist of it, is that the paper that produced these results, which was very widely cited, there was human bias error in the paper, and the result is actually doctor. Um, nurse is the second highest result. But nevertheless, there is gender bias in these models, so I was thinking, how, what's a kind of better way to search for that? So I did a Twitter bot doing that, and what it does is, it picks a random word, looks at man to that word, woman to that word, and then it does both. So you can see here that the highest, second highest result for woman is nurse, man is physician. Um, one of the results for woman is midwife, whereas for man you get surgeon. So these are gender bias that the model has learned because these are trained on the internet, right? So there's a lot of these results. It's like it's getting quite interesting. Like sedan is associated with woman, van is associated with man. Um, but then as we go further out, it starts getting quite abstract. Like uh, a woman is a berry while a man is an acorn, like does that mean anything? I, I could maybe write an essay on that, but maybe <laughs> not. Um, so I don't know at what point we know what the model has learned versus what the human has learned. Because also the results here, I might look at and take one meaning in one direction, but you might look at it and go in the complete opposite direction. And I find that really fascinating about the way we take meaning from the world. So, I'm talking too much about AI. There's too much hype about AI, so let's talk about something else, VR. Um, so this project is exploring just specifically that. It is a VR project, but actually I think of it more as a non-VR project. I'll explain why. It's about empathy, um, but not empathy as in VR, the ultimate empathy machine, but more like the impossibility of empathy in that, yeah, well, I'll explain. There's a few motivations behind the work. Um, it's a lot of words here, I guess I'll try and summarize, but the gist of it is that what we perceive to be real is a reconstruction in our minds. It's a simplified model of the world. 
limited by our biology and physiology. I think we live in a world now where with quantum mechanics we know, like I know that this is mostly empty, but it appears solid because evolutionarily that's what's efficient for me. Perception is an active process. It requires action and integration. The actions that we take affect the reality and the meaning that we construct in our mind. I'm going to talk about each one of these briefly. But most importantly, even when presented with the same information and the exact same images, everybody will experience and will see something unique and personal which nobody else can see or even understand. And this happens on a perceptual level, which I'm interested in exploring, but also on a higher level, especially now looking at the level of social polarization and political polarization we have you know, in my home country of Turkey, um, in the UK where I live with Brexit, and I hear, uh, you know, here in the US, I hear you have some issues as well. So it's to, it's to do with that. And just very briefly, we often think of our eyes as cameras, as you know, light falls on the retina and boom, I have a picture. But that's not how it works at all, obviously. We have the bit of the eye that's actually high resolution and color is the fovea, which is about you know, the size of a thumbnail at arm's length. Um, but to me, it looks like you know, I have this huge full color, full resolution vision, but of course the eye is actually circading all over the place two or three times a second and then the brain is integrating the information of the movement of my head, the movement of my eyes, with that tiny bit of signal that's coming from the eye. There's about 130 million photoreceptors in each eye, but only about a million in the optic nerve, so there's already a compression of about 130 to one already happening um, at the retinal level. So we know a lot of this through Alfred Yarbus in the 50s and 60s. He used this, what looks like a torture device, to um, do these amazing experiments, and he even found that when you asked people questions about a particular scene, it affected the way that the people scanned the scene. So the actions that the people took affected the knowledge, the information that they took from the scene. And I find that a really profound um, bit of information. And Alvanoe, the philosopher, likens seeing with the eye is actually more akin to seeing with one hand as say, a visually impaired person might do. Um, and I was thinking of this when I experienced the wonderful Door into the Dark by the artist Collective Anagram a few years ago where you're blindfolded and barefoot and set into a space and have to navigate using only your hands and your feet and your ears. And as someone who's not used to this, I'm very conscious of the way I was navigating and I was putting my hands out, trying. I was circading with my hands. As soon as I found an object, I would fixate on it and circade up and down and in my mind constructing these mental images. Um, and I was doing this consciously, but that's what we do all the time when we're looking with our eyes. And what's elevated to a higher level of conscious awareness is a single visual percept of a 3D world. So this piece tries to destroy that. It uses a phenomenon known as binocular rivalry, uh, which is, is a phenomenon that's been known for centuries and has been scientifically studied, whereby you give radically different images to each eye for example, left eye sees these horizontal, uh, vertical red lines, right eye sees these horizontal blue lines. And so the conscious percept is not a blend of the two. This is what I see. I see something like this. And I think most people will see something like this. But even if the images are static, the actual conscious percept is dynamic. It's, it's moving. Furthermore, it depends on your physiology. It depends on who you are. So every person will see something unique and it's impossible for me to know what you see. And you're not gonna be able to draw it. You're not gonna be able to explain it very well. So it's going to be a very, very personal uh, experience. So the project is called Fight. I usually present it as an installation um, like this, where I try to create a very homely, a uh, welcoming environment with a slight twist of WTF, um, hinting that something is not quite right, and hopefully hinting that you're about to go on some kind of a journey, even a spiritual journey, one might call. The aesthetics are very, very simple. Um, it drifts in and out of rivalry, so at times it's you know, relatively comfortable, at times it gets a bit uncomfortable. 
and there's three different scenes which correspond to the three points I made earlier about, for example, the act of seeing uh, is an active process. Like, it doesn't just happen on your eyes. You have to move, and the act of moving affects the meaning that you take. So, for example, there's a scene which corresponds with that, where the way you move, where you look, is you're constructing your own personal reality. And binocular rivalry has been studied for centuries, and it's been studied now as well, um, particularly in the study of consciousness, because when you're receiving the two images, they are in your brain. They are even in your visual cortex. Um, they're just not elevated to your visual conscious awareness. And this image is from a paper whereby apparently through meditation um, you can fully control and suppress which image gets elevated. So I find that quite fascinating. I want to talk about some very recent research now. This is very, very much work in progress. I've been working with sound, and this is a network trained on Chopin. Um, as you might gather, I'm not trying to pass the Turing test of sound here. I know this sounds nothing like Chopin. Um, all I'm trying to do is generate sounds in a way that I can manipulate them in real time that have some quality of the training set, but are not like the training set. So this is Chopin. <laughs> so these are trying to sing. Again, I don't want to replicate human singing. I want machine singing. Like, what is a machine singing sound like? This one's one of my favorites. Oh, no, not this one. Yeah, this is more of a technical test of how the morphine works, but you know that. Oh, yeah, so here... Actually, I'll go back a sec. Um, I can also feed samples into these networks. So I, um, what I'm about to play is a kind of DJ set where I'm feeding in samples. The key thing here is the morphing. So I was trying to get morphing working quite well. And you can hear at some of the transitions. So this is the output of the network. I call it deep mix. the whole thing it's about an hour long but it's just the next one I really like I want to play Birds are cool. So you get the idea, and the way this is working is quite fascinating because all of this, it's actually, the technology is agnostic of the medium. So this is the same stuff that I was using for the visual um, examples that I showed before, and actually, so the next thing I will show is kind of the latest work in progress. So this is called Deep Meditations. This is um, a deep dive into and controlled exploration of the inner world of a neural network trained on everything. Literally everything. I scraped Flickr for the tag everything. Um, and there were a lot of flowers in there. I think 
as Flickr. But also I like I search for words like the world, universe, space, mountains, oceans, flowers, and a bit more abstract concepts like art, life, love, faith, ritual, God. So I took all of this stuff, just dumped it into this melting pot. And again, I didn't do any, usually when you train on mixed categories like this, you label data. I didn't do any of that. Um, so the network doesn't know anything about categories. It doesn't know that a nebula is not bacteria. If there's some kind of aesthetic commonalities, it will try to utilize those. And this allows me to navigate. And this is how I was saying, the sound is also generated by the same network that I used in the previous um, examples. Basically, I learned this high dimensional space of stuff, which I'm then able to navigate. And then in controlling how I navigate that space, I'm able to control the sounds and the imagery that comes out of it. Here the sounds are trained, I scraped YouTube for uh, religious chants and spiritual ceremonies and stuff like that. This is also an hour long. These are just snippets. And the very last thing I'd like to show is a teaser that I made for, for this project. Uh, that's it. Thank you for listening. I think we have time for questions. I'm happy to answer.